All right, what's up, guys? We're back, uh, episode three, uh, going into the ankle treatment and management portion of uh, our series. If you were a little bored by the last video, sorry about that, but it was just educational. This is going to move a little bit more into the fun stuff. But before we get into it, me and Vito just attended the combined section meeting out in San Diego for the APTA, and we just wanted to chat a little bit about that and. Let's get into it. So, Vito, tell me about a couple of the sessions that you ended up going to. Yeah. Um, first off, it was really cool. The San Diego Convention Center is massive. Like, they can host so that That place is huge. There's so many events, tons of people, lots of cool booths, won a lot of free stuff, won some free hokas. That was, that was maybe nice. the highlight. I know. <laughs> um, but so some of the sessions that I went to, um, obviously, we are leaning towards sports. So I try to find as many sports things as I could. And it opened up with a banger. There was a return to re uh, return to running protocol uh, that was really, really cool. Um, and it came at it from a diff couple different places. Uh, one of the presenters, I wish I knew names. Uh, I probably can go back and look, but um, it's from the University of Wisconsin, works in their running lab and did a whole series on like looking at mechanics. Uh, what are the things that you want to look for when running? Um, so I got a bunch of notes there that kind of improve my assessment when working with running athletes. Uh, we had a guy who was using the example of an ACL because he works with ACLs primarily and return to running um, and return to play and some of the things that we look at. And one of the interesting notes that I got from his presentation uh, was what, how are we defining or, or what are the things we're using to get people back? And 99% of people use time says they're ready. And then less than like, 11% use strength and clinical judgment. So range of motion, strength, effusion, or clinical motion. Anyway, fusion, range of motion, power, performance, that aspect, and then even less um, kinematics, which I thought was really interesting. If you want to get someone back to where they want to be, don't you want to make sure they're running the way that they should be? So interesting places to grow in the field. Um, and then also like considering the loss of limbs. So there's the, the normalized quad torque that they use for the knee. And that just means that you need to assess where the quad loss is. So you have the affected side that's obviously impaired the unaffected side, which has losses because there's an affected lower extremity. So there's been losses on that side. And if you want to get back to where they were, you can't just get them equal. You have to train both again. And you got to make sure that you're trying to keep that unaffected limb as strong as possible during the whole rehab process. Um, and it just pushed me back to like thinking is like, we got to get dynamometers. We got to get our own. Like <laughs> there's, there's no substitute when dealing with patients. Um, even if you have weaker individuals, MMT is just not as applicable. It's variable, especially with side to side. Um, we, our hands are great as we become better clinicians, but we don't know everything like we it, you can't just feel strength and numbers are great hand diamond thermometers are awesome use them if you got them especially when you have stronger patients uh then i went to a return to duty for military which is another cool thing um they're working on developing a couple uh specific outcome measures to hopefully be released in the next couple of years because they're becoming validated but they use the idea of the lefts and it's just not super applicable because some of the things are, you know, rolling over in bed, but that not might not be a problem for an athlete. Like, great, you can get all four points there. It's developing tools that make more sense for the populations we want to work with. Uh, and then, of course, the many faces of sports PT, which is just really cool to see all the athletic trainers, the sports SBTs, and who's done what, how their paths are just wild to where they got to, and just hearing some really cool stories. Um, mm -hmm. But those are the main ones I saw. Which ones did you go to? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I went to the many faces of sports PT also. I found it really interesting and really humbling just hearing all the different backgrounds that everyone had coming out. And I feel like at some point it definitely put me back into like my place. And I'm just like, okay, I'm still a student. Half of these people haven't got any like big headway until like 10 years in. So I'm in a good spot. It makes you feel uh, better about where you're at. It does. It's refreshing, I would say, because at some point you just hear all these big names and how much they've accomplished, but then you realize like that took them years. 
Uh, I also got the opportunity to, to attend a mental toughness uh, uh, section. That was really interesting. And it uh, kind of made me realize that we have a really good education. Uh, the whole hierarchical like pattern or model that they use was a lot of stuff that we learned in one of our courses, which was our movement science, I believe. And it basically addressed the idea of uh, patient and athlete autonomy and giving them some kind of control and cueing that is going to help them understand the movement that you want to achieve and reproducing those in a more, um, what's the word, a more specific, sport specific pattern in their training and giving them some sort of choice within that. And ultimately that's going to lead to a better resiliency in that athlete ideally and help prevent sports burnout, which if you're an athlete, you, I'm sure you've experienced burnout at some point. It gets um, to all of us, always. especially in high, especially in high, com high competition. So that was one of the big ones I really enjoyed. I also went to a, a hip strengthening uh, course for geriatrics. That one was more personal for me because I'm going to be going into an inpatient rehab facility for my next rotation and thought it'd be good to have some, some kind of framework for what I'm going to be treating with these patients. Uh, it was specifically hip strengthening post hip fracture. So a little specific, but all around very helpful. Yeah. I kind of want to piggyback off that mental toughness when you're talking about with our, um, yeah. So we also had the same thought. So I went with another classmate, Savannah, to that military one. And there's three presenters in the middle presenter. It literally felt like we were getting a lecture that we'd already had um, from movement or what was it? Uh, was it movement science? With um, Andy. Yeah, with Andy. And it went back into feedback strategies, uh, learning styles, practice and you know, distribution. And then also went into the idea of training a task to learn how to move, not training a task to learn how to do a task, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so if you want to get really, really good at something, you got to try it in different environments, static versus unstable, um, and then or loud versus or closed versus open environments, and then changing the task subtly along the way so that they're still learning and still branching new um, neural pathways but it was just like oh we've we've learned this we're, we're getting a re we're getting everything that we should be getting and then there's the whole talk about neuroplasticity that we had uh it was like mm -hmm. kind of those words like oh yeah we we've had that uh we've talked about that for the, like our last yeah. year and a half there it's it's not new to us it's it's commonplace right yeah yeah it didn't seem like a buzzword when you heard it no i was like oh yeah obviously I, we know what that is um so those are the sessions you went to. What are your, maybe your major thoughts? What are the things you learned that you're the thought you were like the coolest stuff for you? So the biggest things that I kind of took away in terms of like programming treatment were kind of the big things I was going for. And I wanted to like kind of feed into and invest on where that kind of, like you said, specific movements aren't what we are training for. We're using those specific movements to train for something else. And it's important to, as, be as best as you can, reflect what the patient's going to be doing in actuality. Because we, I believe in the mental toughness one, again, they mentioned how injuries occur higher. And we kind of touched on this on our first episode, the injuries occur higher during this competition. And whether that's the lack of concentration or whether that's just the stress level, we don't know. So it's best to make a situation where your patient's going to have a similar kind of experience during their treatment. So it just tells me I got to get very creative and pick my CI's brain as I go through it. But, yeah. yeah. Um, for me, and you were there for this the thing, I think that was probably the most uh, valuable uh, the two things that I got with most valuable was one, take a breath and slow down. Uh, mm, I <laughs> you can relax that. a little bit. Um, 
things it we're building we're currently building a resume with what we're doing here with what we're you know the credentialing that we're working on here on the side that we're just getting into um and who we're trying to surround ourselves with is going to push us to the places that we need to be in um and related to that the second thing that i took away was networking um and just going in with an open brain and just trying to learn as much as you po- as possibly can from everyone. Like it, you're going to have people that are clinically trained uh, in specialties. You're going to have people that learned on the job on the fly. Uh, you're going to have people that still do a lot of academic work and have people that work maybe more in training now than they do in actual rehab and just pick the, from the brains of all the people that you can, like you said, same with your CIs and then just trust that what you've learned is great. You can always learn more and you have help around you. I think that was the other thing I really got. It was like, you you have help around you. You don't have to be perfect all the time and make a mistake, but reflect on it and then be better the next time around. So, you know, easy stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Well said. Well, all right. Let's, uh, Let's get into it then. I think that's enough talk for our CSM stuff. If you guys have questions feel free to comment and we'll get back to you um, all right, um, all right. jumping into the next session right is uh tissue healing timelines and phases of rehab okay cool um so again we have a really good program here at regis so we were given a table i'm not going to share it because we didn't build it it's not our information but just to relate it for you guys um uh dr jagger it taught our exercise foundation class and coalesced as much uh, literature she could um, for tissue healing timelines, going through the different levels and the different phases. And it's something that I turn back to all the time now, especially with our MM series, like trying to figure out what's wrong. It's like, great, right? Where's the tissue at now? Um, and just quick breakdown, since we're going to mostly talk about some tendon and ligament cases, we're going to go through those timelines. And luckily they pair up pretty well. Uh, the first phase of tissue injury is going to be inflammatory. Uh, it doesn't specify, you know, how big the injury was, but it's going to go to an inflammation phase, usually from zero to one weeks. Some say seven to 10 days. That's where you're going to have uh, vasoconstriction. Uh, then everything's going to move in. It's going to try and rework the tissue. It's, then it'll start degrading. And then that starts to overlap into that proliferative phase where you're getting new collagen, new elastin, more cleanup, more blood vessels. And that's all weeks one through six. And then remodeling and maturation kind of blend through uh, ligaments. They say it's roughly one plus month. So around this four to six week mark, maybe after, depending on the prognostic factors related to the patient, whether they're older, they're younger, previous injuries, um, maybe around a month, you're going to enter that remodeling phase, which is going to strip and lay down, strip and lay down, strip and lay down until all the fibers are in the right row and thick enough. And then for tendon, just a little bit longer, usually around the two to four month mark. For maturation, it takes a long time, years. The tissue's most likely never going to respond. Like there's, they say it's what it's 85% tension of uh, whatever the previous original tissue is healing like what or healing strength was. Um, and it just takes a long, long time to get back to what it was. And that's where we come in. We can kind of work on that. Um, and then related to that, we'll get into it a little bit more towards the bottom. But so in the inflammatory phase, things are damaged, they're healing. We call it the max protect phase. We're going to do more protecting, uh, preventing re-injury as much as we can. As it gets in that proliferative phase, where we're starting to lay down new stuff. That's where we're going to go into our moderate phase. We're going to be able to do a little bit more, try to shape the tissue in a way that's going to support the athlete. And then that min protect phase is where we're really you know, walking back the restrictions, pushing the athlete a little bit more, and then even getting in towards that performance side which if you're working in a performance training clinic, you might still have access to them, or this is where you're giving them their final HEPs. And then hopefully, you know, like we talked about building your network with the strength coaches that you know they're getting back to, or hopefully you've talked to at some point, mm-hmm. building that HEP with that, with that strength coach. Right. Well said. That's, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit more after we go through some of the pathologies. But before that, when, you, when you're screening the patient, We always got to rule out a fracture, right? So that's going to be one of our biggest red flags. I feel like that's the biggest cop out when during our lecture, the faculty will just ask, so what red flags? And the first thing to go out is unstable fracture. So always, 
every single time. Oh, by the way, you probably should have. Did we say that we we're doing ankles, like ankle and foot injuries? Yeah. We didn't. That's what we we're working on today. Okay. Yeah, I said that in the intro. Anyways, uh, so how do we roll out fractures of the ankle? Auto ankle rolls. All right. So there's going to be like five key things that you want to palpate and look for tenderness or pain. So we have the posterior edge of the lateral malleolus. We have the posterior edge of the medial malleolus. Then we have the base of the fifth mat, the navicular bone. And the other thing to rule out is if they immediately after the injury cannot bear weight for more than four steps. And at that point, you would refer to radiologists or if they somehow know these rules, they'll take themselves and rule out the fracture during an x-ray or plain film. And those are the big things behind ruling out fracture for us. Um, uh, one, more, one, more, one more thing with that too is if it's an adolescent, like going through puberty or you know, prepubescent or high school athlete, almost always radiograph. Just the risk of if, there, if there's bone still growing and there's a physical plate injury, we just get them checked. All right. Insurance is usually going to cover an x-ray post-injury, especially if they have their parents' insurance. This should be great, right? We should refer yeah. out for an x-ray. Yeah, good point, good point. But okay, some pathologies. Do you want to take them through the high ankle sprain? Yeah, I'll start with that. So you should see a picture popping up here on the screen uh, at the very bottom. If you're an NFL fan, you probably saw Pat Mahomes and watched his whole thing. It was a big discussion. Was, is he going to play? Can he play? How much can he play? Can he run? Uh, so what wild card round to play the, the, the Jaguar, no divisional round to play the Jaguars. And as he's rolling out to the right, gets rolled up on, and you can see in the picture a little bit, uh, clear external rotation. If you have the eye for it, uh, his femur is, you know, or his leg is externally rotated. And then what you can't see under the guy's foot is he's in max dorsiflexion. Primary mechanism is external rotation combined with dorsiflexion, that's how you're going to get the high ankle sprains. And what that is, is a damage to the syndesmosis or the anterior tibial fibular ligament. Oh my gosh, I lost the page. There we go. Um, and so that's what binds those two bones together. I mean, talked about in the anatomy episode, the talus sits in between the two ligaments right here. And as, as it sits back, it spreads those apart. And if you go too forcefully or just repetitive over time, that tissue that's sitting right here, that's keeping those bones together, that's how it gets damaged. So uh, in that case, you got a high ankle sprain. We grade it at uh, three levels. Uh, first, th if the joint's stable, there's mild tenderness um, at the distal TF joint, but the radiographic findings are normal, then you know that it's a grade one. Uh, grade two is going to have a partial disruption. The radiographics findings are still going to be uh, okay, uh, but you're going to get some positive uh, ex um, positive tests. Uh, the primary one is going to be the clear, which is literally putting it through the same mechanism. It's dorsiflexion with a little external rotation. And then the squeeze test, uh, that's going to be uncomfortable. And then, so the squeeze test also is not at the joint level. It's above it, just to clarify. Uh, and then the grade three is going to be a complete rupture of the tip bib ligament. You're going to see that on uh, the radiographic findings and you're going to need surgery. That's If it's a full tip fib ligament tear, it's that's the intervention to start with. And then, then we'll come in afterwards. Um, so like I mentioned, the primary test is going to be that Klieger, same mechanism, dorsiflexion with external rotation. I keep uh, checking for the integrity of it uh, and the squeeze test. You're going to palpate the tibia first. The reason you do that is you want to make sure that there's not any fractures on the tibia. You can do the same thing on the fibula. Um, and then our symptoms are going to be point tenderness. Uh, if it is an external rotation and dorsiflexion injury, you also want to check the deltoid ligament. That's going to help. That's what re um, resists eversion. So we want to make sure that that hasn't been damaged and rule in, rule out if there's going to be any treatment there. Uh, you're also not going to see a lot of swelling um, or as much bruising as you will with a low ankle sprain. Those are one of the big dividers. Um, not, not only is it a different mechanism, but high ankle sprain, less, uh, less or no swelling and less or no ecchymosis. Um, and then obviously same thing if there's pain with dorsiflexion. So if they're walking and it's a terminal stance or just a mid stance, hopefully not mid stance, you know, that's probably a thing to check. Um, that's not a sprain. You want to take over for low? Yeah, I can take over low. 
So low ankle sprain, I feel like this is the one we commonly associate with any kind of ankle involvement or when people say they've sprained their ankle. That's our go-to. Uh, primary mechanism of injury is going to be plantar flexion with hind foot inversion and adduction of the forefoot. Uh, if you want to pause the video and take your ankle through that motion real quick, uh, it's basically like pointing your toe down and in. And so main ligaments involved are going to be all of those lateral ones. So our ATFL, CF, and PTFL. And then we have a few grades, just like the high ankle sprain. There's set up by three. So grade three or grade one, let me start at grade one, is going to be that mild tenderness, some swelling, uh, typically no loss of function and no real instability. The patient's still going to test negative on a stress test. And then grade two, we're going to get a little more moderate pain and swelling and some ecchymiosis that's going to be a little tougher to ambulate. And then there's going to be tenderness that structure should you palpate, ATFL, CF, PTFL, they're not going to like it. And then some loss of function or typically just pain within range. So not going to be in that area too much early on. And then grade three, that's a severe swelling and bruising, loss of function and severe instability. So they're not going to be weight bearing for a while on that for grade three. And then some tests. Okay. So during our tests, when we first look at the ankle, we're going to see a lot of uh, effusion pretty much at the site and distal. So the foot's going to blow up pretty much. And then we have a little bit of a cluster. I only call it a cluster because it has, if they're all three positive, they have really good psychometrics. And that is a positive anterior drawer test, tenderness over the ATFL and the presence of ecchymiosis. So those three together have pretty high sensitivity and specificity and a positive likelihood ratio and negative. And then a couple others that we can also include just to really hunker down and confirm our uh, diagnosis is going to be that Taylor tilt test. And that mainly tests the CF. So on a more severe ankle sprain, we're going to want to rule out that CF involvement. So Taylor tilt test is what's going to do that for you. And then also a posterior drawer. So just like anterior drawer, just reverse motion. And these are all pain provoking. So you're not going to push in super hard or rapidly. You're going to ease into the motion because you don't want to cause further damage to that structure. Pretty good rule of thumb for any pain provoking test. And I feel it gets really sent home during our lecture times when we go over it all. So just thought I'd hammer that in again for you to hear it. And then shall we go into Achilles tendinopathy? Yeah, why don't you take that one and then I'll take back over for a tip poster. Okay. So Achilles tendinopathy used to be Achilles tendinitis. Then we found out that wasn't the most appropriate word. So we only could say it's not the appropriate word and went to tendinopathy because technically there is no true inflammation of the joint, but it's a combination of pain, thickening of the tendon and impaired performance of the Achilles. And this is usually due to overtraining, jump training and commonly footwear, which we kind of talked about footwear in our last episode. So that's perfect little matchup for that. And some tests that we're going to be doing for Achilles tendinopathy, we're going to do ankle dorsiflexion range motion. It's typically going to be reduced or limited. And that's because of a protective tightening almost on the tendon, just a shortening. And then plantar flexion endurance tests. And you're just going to put the patient through 25 calf raises and they'll most likely stop or report a lot of pain or discomfort. And then next is gonna be the arc sign test, which if you don't remember the arc sign, patients in prone with feet hanging off the table, you're palpating along the Achilles tendon and having them do some ankle pumps and you're feeling essentially for uh, the ball or the mass that they may or may not have reported to move up or down or not at all. And if it moves over down, that tells you it's tendon involved. If it doesn't, that means it's just more superficial and other surrounding tissue causing it. So that's why it's important to always palpate the tendon. And that's going to be one of our last tests for that. And then I think 
that's going to be all for Achilles tendinopathy. And then we're going to move into PTD, posterior tendon dysfunction. So the tibialis posterior tendon, um, I don't remember if we talked about it as much how it runs, but um, it's an interesting one because it's related to pes planus. Um, so what it is, the tibialis posterior runs along the medial malleolus. It comes uh, under the arch of the foot. And it's one of our main dynamic stabilizers of the longitudinal medial arch. So it's what allows us to keep our foot when it tightens up. It has passive structure help, but it locks that foot into place, especially during that push off. Um, and it's also the primary inverter of the foot. So focusing on inversion. So if we have our press off, you'll notice that the heel kind of swoops in, especially in sprinting athletes. Uh, so that is going to be supported by the posterior tip. Um, the mechanism of injury. So similarly, it's been tendonitis, which it could be if it's an inflammatory state. It could be tendinosis if it's in a degenerative state or if it's thickened and just off, not working properly. It could be tendinopathy. Make sure you match the appropriate word. But in general, the posterior tendon dysfunction is the overarching concept. Um, the mechanism of injury is going to be overuse. It's going to be a lot of repetitive loading or if you have an, a couple of instances of overpronation. That pronation is that dipping of uh, that first first met all the way through, where it's putting a lot of stretch in the posterior tip. That could cause an injury there too. Uh, for the prevalence, uh, there's a bunch of risk factors. I use Physiopedia here just because it's a great access or resource to support some of the stuff they already have. It's all cited, and the ones worth noting for risk factors is young athletes. So if we want to extrapolate what that could mean, one they're developing, they're, they're maybe going into feet. Uh, their feet are getting bigger and they're learning how to run on them again, or they maybe don't have great move mechanics yet. That could be something that contributes to that overuse or that overpronation or the repetitive loading. Other thing would be ligaments dyslaxity. If the ligaments aren't as supportive in that foot and the tendon's doing all the work that it needs to for the medial longitudinal arch, that's going to have a lot more stress. Uh, and then similarly, previous trauma, almost always, especially a couple ankle fractures didn't specify which ones, but ankle fracture, previous ankle fractures could increase the risk of TPTD. Uh, and then it affects anywhere between about 3.3 and 10% of the population. May not seem like a lot, but it is something to notice. Some of the tests and measures, uh, the primary ones for uh, TPDD is going to be pain along the muscle belly or the tendon, easily palpatable. They'll let you know if you're on it and that's what's causing it then you can do the active portion of it. So it's our in primary inverter. If you're putting it into, if you're having them doing a resisted or an active plantar flexion inversion movement, that's going to cause pain if it's what's involved. And then similarly, if you're going to put a passive stretch on it, so they're not doing anything, you're just going to pull a little into dorsal flexion and a little eversion, that's going to put the tendon on stretch. If it's if that's what's bothering it, well, then you have a positive one. That's similar to the Klieger test. So make sure you're asking, where's your pain? they'll probably be able to point and tell you, like, oh, that's like right in between, um, right above my talus or right above my ankle. Or if it's on the medial side, well, now I'm thinking posterior tibialis dysfunction. Something else to consider is using the FBI. If there's new or insidious onset of pes planus, that's not listed. That's just insight. It's the primary cause of flat foot deformity in adults. That's new onset. So if the tendon's ruptured or the tendon's not working properly and it's on stretch and they're just now their foot's just flattening and flattening and flattening, that could be a sign that that posterior tendon, uh, tibialis posterior, posterior tendon is just not doing its job. Uh, and then there's one more pathology I wanted to focus on. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of differential diagnoses, but I'll pass it back to you, Vince. Yeah. So last one, and then we'll get into our interventions and management is chronic plantar heel pain. Uh, a lot of people commonly call it uh, plantar fasciitis, which is another misnomer for it. Um, that is just going to be pain and symptoms that are originated at the central, central band of the plantar fascia. So medial calcaneal tuberosity, if you can't remember what the insertion was called. Um, it's pretty prevalent. During, in our notes, we have that it's affecting 2 million Americans a year. Uh, that site was not, sort, was not cited by the doc I had but I'm just going to go for it and assume they're right and trust in the doc. So some tests and measures, they're pretty straightforward. Obviously you're going to palpate the area and look for tenderness. Uh, you're also going to do a windless test. If you can't remember what a windless test is, you have the patient stand, you lift their big toe and you look for an increase in the arch of their foot. 
and then you're also going to test range of motion. So range of motion is going to be pretty limited, probably due to pain or discomfort. And you'll note that. And yeah, chronic pain and heel pain is a very short one. That is all I have to say about it. So we're going to move into interventions and some management stuff. Yeah. So then, going good. Oh yeah. I was just going to let you talk. Okay. Uh, so going back to uh, knowing where your tissue is at, um, we talked about it a little bit with the healing timelines, but max protection phase, mod protection phase, min slash no protection phase. Again, this is all coming from one of our, be- one of my more favorite courses that we've had uh, just because of the information that we got and it just trained us to think about what all we need to do um, as a clinician, especially as it relates to MSK injuries. So this is, Again, not ours. We got it from Dr. Jagger. I'm not going to share her her table that she gave us because it's not ours to share, but it did kind of shape our you know clinical decision-making model, the things we're going to focus on. So I'll talk about a couple of things. Uh, patient education in all phases is important. That goes to getting therapeutic alliance. That goes to making sure they understand if they have questions and then things that you think that maybe they don't know, um, talking about mechanics, talking about loading, talking about what is passive range versus active assisted, which is, you know, what is active um, and how we want to progress them. So yeah, you might not be doing a lot more, but our goal is to progress to the place where you're doing a lot. Patient education at every stage is always valuable. Um, Soft tissue mobility is always going to be something that we're going to consider, especially if there's post-surgery or scar. So if say they had a grade three where there's a full rupture and they have to have it surgically reattached, well, we're going to do some scar mobilization. We can teach them how to do that. Uh, And then similarly price is something we talk about it's the protect rest ice compression um joint mobility always something we had to consider we never want to lose range of motion almost every study you'll see coming out on almost all things except for maybe a spinal fusion or you know immediate cube post you know cervical fracture or something get them moving uh so we can do like we said range of motion work then there's also graded mobilizations manips probably not in max protect phase uh, <laughs> muscle flexibility if someone's not been able to work through a full range yet, their muscles might be shortening up, especially if it's a longer recovery. You know, the high ankle sprains are going to take a lot longer, especially if there's an inflammatory phase, depending on the grade as well. So those muscles might shorten up. The gastroc might be really, really tight. Soleus might be tight. TA might not be functioning well. So you can work through all that. Neuromuscular control. I like to think of that as like the earliest onset and muscle performance, you know, neuromuscular control into endurance, into strength, into power. The last three, it just depends on who you're, who you're training and what their goals are, but it's like the starting point of getting things back up, getting the muscles working again, getting more recruitment. Uh, some of those principles of muscle performance that we'll get into in some of our training episodes coming up. Balance, uh, that's going to be, you know, progression. Something we kind of mentioned early on in my start in a static closed environment with a lot of assistance available as needed and then progressing to open environments, dynamic environments, and then, especially if they're an athlete, they're probably going to have some sort of cardiopulmonary training that's involved. So just making sure you're one dosing it correctly. And then also um, putting them into modalities that are going to be beneficial for them from a safety standpoint, primarily early on, and then getting them closer and closer back to what the task that they are returning to, which we also alluded to earlier in the episode from what we got at CSM is, you know, we're, we're training movements, in one way to support a function. And then we're going to keep progressing it back towards the task that we really want them to get back to. Um, That's a general overview, a lot of information, uh, but those are the, you know, things we want to focus on at different levels that can be progressed as we go through. Yeah. So Uh, it might be a little overlap, but (laughs) yeah, you covered that pretty quick, but yeah, obviously as we know, max protection phase is essentially you're managing symptoms in almost immediately, whether that's their swelling, their pain, if that's you're preventing pain using some graded mobs, one and twos are going to be those pain reducing motions and even just passive range. Cause we know to lube the joint, you just got to keep them moving. So, and that'll also help reduce swelling couple good exercises, elevated ankle pumps. We know those that's going to be money for that patient for the next week or so until we can actually get some movement going and even compression, uh, whether you want to use not gauze and we learned that, 
just uh, an ace bandage, just doing that uh, circular pattern in decreasing pressure as you come up to help uh, facilitate. facilitate motion and just making sure the patient's comfortable during that first like week or so. And then as we know with our tissue, tissue healing timeline, after a week or so, we can move into the moderate protection phase and we can get a little bit more uh, challenging in our treatment, I would say. So you'd be moving into those grade threes and four mobs, whether that's uh, door mobilization at their end range or whatever. You just want to make sure you're not provoking or agitating the site of injury too soon, right? And early on in that mod protection, we're going to be doing some active assisted range of motion, whether that's just manual with your hand, just having them move with you or you, they move their own foot. And then later on during that mod, you can go into more of a active range of motion pattern. And then let me see manual therapy talked about that. Um, uh, Muscle flexibility. So Vito kind of mentioned this earlier, muscle flexibility. We, during our max protect, we're not going to really do too much of the site and say we're going to intervene uh, systemically up and make sure no other sites are becoming impaired because of the immobility lower. And at this point, we'll be able to start progressing into more flexible stuff going on at the ankle. So more ankle stretching and calf stretching at that point. And while still maintaining all of the other stretching, I don't think it's bad to keep including that. I would say that would be a great home program and not something you would do in the clinic. You agree? Yeah, no, I agree. Things that you can teach them to do on their own is better. So you can have more time for education or hands-on treatment that they don't get at home. I mean, you don't want them mm -hmm. to start coming in as thinking, oh, it's massage time. It's still got to be work. Uh, we want to use a session to progress and, you know, get stronger and, and teach as much as we can, especially uh, you shift from being the rehab specialist into the coach uh, towards as the further you go. But yeah, no, I agree. The more we can get them to do one, if you can get them to buy in, do them at home. If they're not doing it at home, well, it's got to be get done in the clinic. So, but yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. And then during this phase, we can get, a little further into that neuromuscular control. Uh, Vito actually educated me on D2 and D1 motions of the ankle, which I totally forgot about and had to have a little re-education on it before this lecture or podcast. I still call it a lecture, dude. I can't get over to the podcast thing. Uh, Welcome. You're in the podcast game. It's okay. Here we are. We made it. But yeah, so that D1, D2 flexion. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. D1 is going to be the plantar flexion inversion motion. Switch. Anyway, so D2. It's, D2 is, is the normal motion. D2 is going to be dorsif or dorsiflexion with the inversion, plantar flexion inversion. Think about the supinate and pronate. Um, and then D1 is going to be dorsiflexion combined with inversion, plantar flexion inversion. Okay. See, there we go. I still need some cushion on it, but then can start integrating that just to get them combined motions. And that's going to help translate over to more of a sports specific tasking, just because it's a more dynamic motion, I would say, than the rigid plantar flexion, torch flexion, eversion, inversion. And then we can also start training some balance during that mod protection. And obviously you want to progress slowly, so me and Vito were talking about this this morning when we hit legs and how the best way to train ankle balance and proprioception is going to be on a firm surface and not an unstable because at that point you are redistributing your uh, balance integration to your vestibular and vision. So keep Which is all surface. great to train. It's all great to yeah. train. You need to, but yeah. you got to damage no, ligament is... and damage ligaments reduce their amount of proprioception because the fiber or the sensory fibers in there are not as great anymore. So we got to retrain sensory motor. We got to make sure we're doing the right system to start. Exactly. Yeah. That's all not to say that training vestibular and vision balance is not a 
is bad. That's all great and good, but sp- task specific intervention, know what you're going for. If you're going for the ankle, ankle probe and balance, stable surface. And then later on progress to more dynamic stuff. Maybe they have to catch and jump and work on their landings. Stuff like that is all going to help single leg, single leg landings. That's going to be more into that no protection phase. And those are going to be some of the progressions we'll see. Do you want to cover more of the men and no protection more specifically? Yeah. Um, so we talked about training balance. Uh, and I think you talked about it being on the firm surface, but you can always start bilaterally uh, working with a literal, just doing um, ankle swings or um, what's that interior posterior rocking ankle sways, sways. That's the word. Mm. Um, and then, you can always do, especially you can begin this probably in the earlier phase, but you can do joint position matching sense. The earlier you get that back, that's probably a good thing. So you can do joint position matching or uh, the joint position t- sense test. Um, I think matching is a pretty good way to utilize the unaffected um, to try and balance it out rather than training just one side. I think it's just a good way to integrate both. Um, don't have any specific knowledge to back that up. That just seems appropriate to me. And um, yeah, so we, we, we probably started with open chain stuff, maybe some bands. Now we're getting back into strength training. Hopefully we used a dynamometer at some point, uh, to compare side to side, and then, uh, we can get into the close strain stuff. So it's a, the ankle is related to that triple extension. So you, yeah, squats, jumps, deadlifts, uh, training's more specific to what the task is. So say we're, you know, we're, we're training a receiver athlete. We're gonna, probably going to get into some sprint training activities. We might do in some sleds where they're going to have a lot of single leg push off. You don't want to just yeah. do bilateral training um, for a sprint athlete. They want power bilaterally, but you are most of the time alternating. So want, make sure you're getting some more of that stuff in. Um, we talked about uh, a couple of things that we like to include. And I was kind of wanted to speak to like the Y balance and the star excursion. They are really good. And then I think it's the, um, so the Y balance, contralateral, reach i forget which direction i can't remember if it's anterior or if it's um uh posterior and across the midline is a really or is validated in measuring imbalance and risk of re-injuries side to side which is great if you can get them equal but it does not completely indicate ability to return to sport that's kind of one of the things that i got from the return to running protocol clinic cl- uh, outcome measures range of motion strength effusion levels of pain are all really, really great, but we are movement specialists. If they're doing those stuff and they're getting to symmetrical reaches, great. But now we need to make sure one dynamometer test to make sure they're, they're equally strength. And like we kind of alluded to as well, I've said like six times, I'm just going to hammer that home, but we need to make sure we're seeing them do the things that they're going to be doing in the sport too. So don't just rely on an outcome measure also do a movement analysis, do it in mm-hmm. all the movements that you think they're going to do. That should be a big contributor on top of being able to do a single leg hop on top of being able to do single leg balance on top of being able to return strength. Make sure you're doing a movement analysis to make sure they're moving in a way that's going to be safe and appropriate to what they're going to getting back to. Um, which I just thought was something that I want to focus on as I start to get out there for my practice. Yeah, well said. I think all of those functional tasks make for great asterisks, even if your asterisk is range of motion. I mean, those are easier, but obviously making it more functional and task specific is going to optimize patient outcomes and their perceived benefit of PT. And obviously we want them in the unfortunate event that they do re-injure, that they come back and get better again. Right. It's an opportunity for us to be creative as movement specialists. Bit of a plug here, but uh, Sanders Fit Rehab down in Dallas, is, we met with uh, one of the clinicians there. And well, if you watch their Instagram page, they're always doing something that is unique, but you can see the function it returns to. Like the, like the other day, uh, someone who's returning to running, they're trying to uh, work on shock absorption and she can't be full weight bearing yet. So they have her on one of those, um, plyo, uh, squat machines. I think they're called like a total gym where you can lower the, 
uh, oh yeah, the, the I use one of those a lot in clinic. And then doing and doing the the push off there to reintegrate that ability to like that you get to have fun and be creative. Um, and so, yeah, just also Instagram. There's a lot of flashy stuff out there that is cool and may not always be appropriate, but it does engage you to be able to be creative. And as long as you're in the right phase, you can modify and adapt to stuff that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see anything flashy, like you're saying, always try it yourself first before you make a patient do it. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Definitely do it yourself. Don't try to do the dragon squat. Uh, <laughs> you can't I'm do it. I'm almost there. Uh, all right. Is all there right. any notes to talk about? No, I think that pretty much covers it. And obviously, if you're at this point in the video, please drop a comment. Let us know what you think we can do better or what you want to hear more about. That'd be great. We love feedback. Yep. Uh, share it with your friends. Uh, also, we'll be posting our docs on a Google Drive. We'll make it available uh, through our Instagram. And then also check out the Instagram. We're going to be posting some training videos coming up. Um, we'll do a little bit of rehab, a little bit of training. And yeah. they should be coming out soon. Yeah. Any little tidbit, little reels that you want to see, let us know. And we'll pop those out as quick as we can. All right. All right. Other than that, thanks Until for next watching. episode. Yeah, we're out. <laughs>